Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Kimmage. I'm the chair of the Kennedy Institute's Advisory Council and a professor of history at the Catholic University of America. Uh, it's it's uh, good to be having another episode uh, of the Long View, the first one since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Ago. My name uh, is Michael Kimmage. I'm the chair of the Kennedy Institute's is Advisory Council. The Institute of the Wilson Center, but it's also co-sponsored by uh, our colleagues in the Wilson Center's Global Europe uh, program. Uh, the method here, if you need to submit questions, if you would like to submit questions, uh, is to do so through one of several ways, either by email, canon at wilsoncenter.org, uh, via Twitter at Canon Institute, uh, or on uh, the Facebook page. Uh, and I will gather those questions and ask them. We very much want this to be uh, a conversation, and so we anticipate and look forward to, uh, to your questions. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, this afternoon to welcome to the Long View, Dr. Liana, uh, Liana Fix. Uh, Dr. Liana Fix is a resident fellow in the German Marshall Fund's Washington office at this very moment, although not for too much longer, sadly. Uh, and she's on sabbatical leave from the International Affairs Department of the Kerber Foundation in Berlin. Uh, Dr. Fix is a historian and political scientist and her work focuses on Russia, Eastern Europe, European security, arms control, and German foreign policy. Dr. Fix has published widely in academia, think tanks, national and international media. She holds a doctorate degree from the Justus Liebig University, Gießen, and a master's degree from the London School uh, of Economics uh, and Political Science. I'm gonna show our audience the book that we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, and I would like to say that Dr. Fix has done something with this book uh, that's quite dangerous in our business of trying to understand and interpret international affairs. In other words, she's published a book. Uh, and that means, of course, there's a lag time between the composition of the book uh, and the unruly world uh, into which this book uh, enters. And never is that, you know, sort of contrast between uh, a book and, and a moment it never has it been quite as acute as it, as it is now. Uh, when we're all glued to Twitter and to cable news and to the very latest uh, developments. But I think it's especially with that circumstance in mind, uh, the intensity of the present moment, that it's really valuable to go back in time and to try to think in somewhat longer arc how we've gotten here uh, and what it all uh, signifies. The title of Dr. Fix's book is Germany's Role in European Russia Policy, A New German Power? Question mark. I wonder if you couldn't republish a second edition of this book, a new German power exclamation point uh, at, this, at this point. You can sort of update the book by, uh, by changing the punctuation. But I want to begin with a question, Liana, about the book that uh, uh, ignores the present moment, that pretends that the present moment is not uh, happening. And uh, as if we were having this conversa conversation six months ago, and if you could uh, without relating it to the present, recreate the arguments of the book and share with us the key insights of this uh, of this remarkable book. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and to discuss my book. And as you said, it was published last year, which already seems um, a world away. Um, but I do think that some of the lessons from the past of Germany's and Europeans' Russia policy do have valuable lessons for, for today. And I will try to outline those perhaps in a, couple, in, in a couple of minutes responding to your question. Um, what we've seen in the last um, weeks and months is that there was a lot of confusion about Germany's role on Russia. Um, just to quote a few headlines um, from Germany has become a weak link, uh, Washington Post to is Germany a reliable ally, Wall Street Journal, but then also Europe's sleeping giant awakens the Atlantic. And just this week after the State of the Union address of President Biden, um, the headline, President Biden is no Olaf Scholz in the Wall Street Journal. So how to explain these um, sort of wildly oscillating views between praise and condemnation on Germany, especially when it comes to Russia. And that's what I tried to do in my book. Um, it is to look at the last 15 years of European Russia policy, to, of European policy towards Russia, and to see when Germany was successful in leading Europe and Russia and why, um, where it was not and why, and also where were Germany's blind spots towards Russia and the continuities and ruptures of its approach. And I think a good way to start thinking about this is to 
take us back to August 12, uh, 2008, um, the very uncomfortable moment um, and strangely familiar now when Russian tanks were rolling deep into Georgian territory, shopping, uh, stopping just short of Tbilisi. And the French president back then, Nicolas Sarkozy, was conducting frantic crisis diplomacy between Moscow and Tbilisi. Um, but he was not the only president in Tbilisi on this, on this August day, August 12th. Um, the presidents of Poland, the Baltic states, and Ukraine were also there addressing a rally outside the Georgian parliament, while Sarkozy was inside trying to get Zakashvili's approval for a ceasefire, ceasefire agreement. And the two European delegations only met for a handshake, um, which reflects um, the entirely different perspectives of the situation that they brought to, brought to Tbilisi on that day. So the one side, the Eastern Europeans, called for solidarity in the wake of Russian aggression, whereas the other side, France, and at that point supported by Germany, framed the conflict as, as an unexpected escalation of a 20-year-old post-Soviet conflict, um, which was basically a Georgian miscalculation and a Russian um, disproportionate response. And in the end, it was the German and French interpretation of the situation that gained the upper hand. Um, Merkel promised that there would be no return to business as usual, um, promising this to the Baltic states where she traveled. But at the end of the year, the EU-Russia Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, which was really the only sanction um, that was um, taken at the time against Russia, was resuming. And Germany argued back then in 2008 that the war in Georgia shows Europe needs more, not less cooperation with Russia. And NATO's Bucharest decision was historical wisdom. So for Germany in the first decade of the 2000 years, um, the question which of course Russia would take was very much still open. And um, Germany tried during the presidency of um, Dmitry Medvedev to run a number of initiatives, the modernization partnership, the Meseberg initiative, all with the hope that there could be some sort of economic, societal uh, transformation of Russia and a common European security architecture. This has very much changed in 2014, um, the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass when it was Germany, not France, that took a prominent role. And um, Germany back then also managed to exceed the lowest common denominator policy that the EU had, had, had at that point. So just to quote a Polish diplomat from my interviews back then, um, he argued if even Germany argues for sanctions against Russia, something must be very wrong, wrong and also that being an EU lay leader became in 2014 more important for Germany than being the principal partner of Russia in Europe. So Germany demonstrated in 2014 how to manage a crisis with Russia, but it did not demonstrate in 2014 how to solve a conflict with Russia. And this is very much what now comes back to us and in a very, um, in a very bitter and, and very terrible way. Wonderful. I have two further questions, but I want to just remind our audience in terms of the questions that uh, uh, that you're most welcome to submit. Please do so through the Kennan Institute email, Kennan at wilsoncenter.org or Twitter at Kennan Institute, uh, or you can use the Kennan Institute's Facebook page to submit your questions. But I still have two further questions uh, to ask about your book. And the second one uh, is to apply the insights uh, and the deep research that goes into your book, to apply it to the present moment. Uh, one aspect of this question is where the continuities lie. Sometimes when you're living through a transition, you exaggerate uh, the scope of a transition. So are there ways in which Germany was moving toward this position gradually, perhaps uh, since 2014 un under Chancellor Merkel, and now Chancellor Scholz is accelerating it under these extreme conditions that were, uh, that were enduring at the moment. And then if you could address the question of what changed Chancellor Scholz's mind. Obviously, we can supply a couple of obvious explanations for that, that the crisis itself changed his, his mind. But if you want to add anything further to that, that would be very interesting to hear. So where do you see continuities and discontinuities from the book that you wrote to the, to the present moment? Yeah. Um, I think there were a lot of concerns that Russia, the Germany would fall back sort of on its traditional impulses um, on Russia. Uh, but I think this concern was to some extent um, not justified because we do see that Germany's Russia policy has developed 
from hope to disillusionment very quickly in the last years. And now even sort of the last remnants of Germany's Russia policy, the energy relationship, which was always considered as a stabilizing force um, from Cold War times is, is into question. Um, but I do think, so there is this continuity of a continuous disillusion, disillusionment on Russia policy. But I do think that there were also some um, fundamental mistakes, or let's perhaps call it misunderstandings uh, by Germany on Russia. So where Germany got Russia and to some extent also Ukraine wrong. And I do think the first mistake is that German policymakers underestimated Russia's domestic development. They underestimated sort of the authoritarian trajectory after the return of, of Vladimir Putin to the presidency in 2012. And what this mean, and to what extent this would also sort of um, shift into foreign policy aggressiveness. I think the second mistake is that Germany has held on for too long to this change through trade rapprochement that it has in its Ostpolitik times and didn't understand that Russian elites were primarily interested in consolidating their domestic hold on power and their sort of own economic enrichment. Um, and I think the third point, and that is perhaps the most significant now, uh, the most tragic, if we can say so, is that Russia, Germany also underestimated Russia's claim to sphere of influence in the neighborhood and especially Russia's willingness to use military force. Um, and back then, Eastern Europeans always felt like they were perceived as um, Cassandras by the rest of Europe. So they felt all the warnings were just sort of falling on, on, on deep ears. Um, and this has sort of already in 2014, this has triggered a soul searching among German diplomats. So why did it all go wrong? Despite our best intentions, um, where, where did we miss? Why was our understanding of Russian interests not the understanding which obviously was, was, was held in Moscow. And some of this um, we unfortunately still saw um, in the last weeks, the underestimation of Russia's willingness to use military force. So Europe for very long held on to the belief that the whole buildup at Ukraine's border is just a negotiation strategy, a Russian negotiation strategy. Um, and also uh, the point that um, sort of, we assume that our interests, which are very much guided by a non-military view on the world, must also sort of reflect Russia's cost-benefit cost analysis. And I think this was um, these were perhaps the, the two mistakes. And to come to your question sort of on Olaf, um, on Olaf Scholz's shift, I think what Russia has achieved in its war in the Ukraine war sort of um, counter to its initial intentions is that there are no Cassandras anymore in Europe. So everyone has now adopted the position of the Eastern Europeans. Um, we can call this the Easternization of Europe, um, but that's what Russia has achieved. This, this part is over. And the second point is that um, it was, I mean, from a historical perspective, it's just fascinating that it was not the eternal competition with France that led Germany now to the biggest shift in its security and defense policy since 1989, but that it was Russia. It was Russian actions that led Germany to now um, jump to uh, defense expenditures, which were unimaginable before. Um, and I've argued before um, that I think um, Germany was even more shocked by Russia's actions than perhaps of other European countries, exactly because of this sort of a civilian power, slightly pacifist mindset that we always had throughout our history. Um, Germany's military is not in a very high regard um, in contrast to France and the UK. So for us, Russia's actions really hit home. It really sort of hit our understanding of a postmodern, um, post-military society and 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 Europe. Um, and with us, I speak I speak of sort of the the, the Germans. Um, and of course, to some extent, it also reminded of the very dark of some very dark hours of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the explanations why, apart sort of from the policy explanations why we now have seen this um, incredible shift in Germany's security and defense policy. Yes, I mean, I think that when we have a, 
long view five years from now and talk about the history of this crisis, one of the really interesting questions is, as what will then be a historical question is the varying responses to the intelligence assessments of, of the US, I think, and a few uh, Five Eyes allies, uh, UK most importantly, that this war was going to happen, which the Biden administration was you know, rhetorically uh, very far out front in terms of articulating that. No doubt that was also communicated through closed doors. Uh, and I think the French and, and German assessment was just very different almost until the moment that the war itself uh, broke out. So that will be intriguing to try to understand why that was the case. And, and you know, it's not a huge aspect of this crisis, but it plays uh, its own kind of interesting role. And I think it speaks to some of the cultural differences about the German imagination of Europe and the German idea of, of war and pacifism, you know, sort of past and present, what's historical and what's, uh, and what's, uh, and what's contemporary. For my third and final question, uh, and uh, you know, let me prompt the audience once again uh, to start with their questions, uh, as it's, it's soon going to be open season, uh, through the, uh, the email address Kenan at WilsonCenter.org, uh, or through Twitter um, uh, uh, at Kenan Institute, or through uh, through Facebook. Um, the third question that I have uh, is because there's been such a celebratory attitude in in, in DC. Uh, about the uh, about the uh, the change in German policy, the reaction seems to be from the Biden administration and from from many sort of related uh, experts and others. You know, at last Germany has kind of seen the light, uh, and you know this is where Germany has to go. I'm wondering, in the aura of that celebration, if we're not in some respects exaggerating the transition. I have in mind two things here. One is, I don't think that you change a culture overnight. You can change a risk calculus overnight. You can change an interpretation of Russia overnight, or Russia has succeeded in changing that itself overnight. But I think Germany, in my experience of it, does have, you mentioned this term as well, a truly pacifist culture. And I wonder if that uh, you know, will change all that quickly. And if it doesn't, um, it's not that it will stop Germany from investing in the military, but uh, uh, it could perhaps slow this process down. And the other thing I have in mind is, uh, is time frame. Because of course the war itself is going to be played out in the next six months or maybe in the next year, uh, the Russian invasion of of Ukraine. But by that point, you know, sort of a year from now, even if Germany starts pouring money into its military, it's not going to have a completely new military in that time. So how long will this take? This change take to uh, to put into practice? So if you could reflect perhaps on the cultural dimensions first, and then. Uh, just issues of, of timing. I don't think we need to analyze too much the decision itself because it seems so forthright uh, and clear in its nature. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to add that sort of the celebratory nature was not only in the United States, it was very much also in Berlin. Um, when Scholz was giving his speech at the end, everyone was standing in the German Bundestag. And if someone would have um, told me a year ago that the whole Bundestag would be standing and applauding apart from sort of the fringe parties to Germany spending 2% on its military, um, that that would have been unimaginable. So the boldness of the decision very much led to a lot of support and also to a shift in Germany's public opinion. So beforehand, arming, sending weapons to Ukraine, sort of increasing defense spending was always met very reluctantly by the German public. And this has now changed completely. There's a huge support um, for these me measures. Um, and I think one of the reasons is, which also relates to your question about sort of the cultural part of it, um, is that for the first time, there is a threat perception, which was not there before. Germany never felt threatened by anyone. It was always, there were always challenges in world politics, um, but there were no real threats. And I think the, the fact that Russia is behaving so recklessly in Ukraine, so that even sort of for a German, it's difficult to say, oh, this is only about Ukraine. This will not affect us, the nuclear signaling by the Russian side. This really um, creates the impression that 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 we need to sort of the Germany needs to to modernize its army because there is a threat out there that we might have to to defend against. Um, and perhaps to add another point, um, which I also find interesting to to your second question, sort of what is the time frame um, that the devil of such huge decisions is obviously always in the detail. Um, I mean, so much money 
I mean, it's incredible sort of, uh, if you look at Germany's sort of GDP, it jumped to 2% from 1.4%. It's just an incredible amount of money. I mean, you have to organize where you put this money into. Um, and as a military analyst here in the US once told me the German military or Germany and its military is like someone who has um, a, a garage with a lot of expensive cars inside, but does not know how to how to use them and doesn't use them, just look at them. And I think that very much reflects um, uh, reflect uh, sort of the the attitude towards towards the military. And another point where sort of I would I would underline your 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 being cautious about this um, is also that this increase in defense spending will have to be sort of embedded in European in a European context, right? I mean, obviously it will sort of work before NATO, but what role will it play in EU thinking about sovereignty, autonomy? Um, because obviously France would want Germany to uh, bring these capabilities into uh, a, a military posture that benefits the European Union. And that is not a German, uh, Germany rearming itself. Um, and it sort of relates also to a debate about Germany's leadership in the past in Europe which was sometimes also critical about um, the way how Germany portrayed its leadership role as just for the common good and not for its own interests. So, I mean, this, um, this word about Germany's responsibility, I mean, responsibility has been a term for 10 years, which uh, has been going around in, in Germany. And basically it was just used as a term to cloak a little bit the fact that Germany has its own interests and its own ambitions in assuming a leadership role and is not only doing it for the common good for Europe. Um, so this term has, um, yeah, has made the rounds, but as I said, it, 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 it diverts from the fact that Germany pursues its own interest with, with some of these issues. Um, and I think these points will, uh, will have to be balanced um, very carefully. And as you said, the time frame of that is, I mean, this is a challenge for a decade. Um, and uh, it's also interesting that thinking about what happens in the United States in 2024 obviously also plays into it. Um, while there's no way that within two years, Europe or Germany can make any significant leap in a sort of military capabilities. This really is something for 10, 15, 15 years um, to develop. And a very last thought on sort of the cultural point, I think everyone was thinking that Germany will always remain a civilian power. Um, but as in the past, I think these questions are really questions of leadership. Um, public opinion attitudes towards sort of the way we see the world is something which can change very quickly if it is shaped in a certain way by political leaders. And I think we're exactly in this period now. Mm. Um, it would have been difficult to expect, but if sort of the whole uh, establishment in Germany now um, uh, is able to communicate that there was a Zeitenwende, that really something has changed, then I think it will also be possible to change these cultural attitudes that have been there um, for decades, because obviously this pacifist stance of Germany has always not been there, <laughs> has not always been there. <laughs> um, so I think it's really up to political leadership. I mean, it's, I'm reminded it's, it's, it's a bit in the comic vein about the prior German response to this question about the 2%, uh, that it, it was at times, well, given how big the German economy and how much it, how, how big it is and how much it grows, you really want a military of that size. In exactly. Germany. Does, does the totally. world want uh, such a military? But, you know, of course, you had messages coming from Poland, uh, you know, a, a few years ago that indeed Poland did, did, did want such a, uh, a German military. And, uh, you know, I think circumstances have changed so much that uh, whatever associations exist that come from the Second World War, they're pretty much, you know, in, in, in the category of ancient history. So we have a number of questions from our, our audience. I'm very happy to see one of them you've just addressed. I'll, I'll make sure to ask it. If you wanna add anything further, please go ahead, but I'll ask two questions then to, to start us off. The first from Philip Lott, what could a new German foreign policy identity look like? Is civil macht, civilian power really dead? So you've spoken about that already. If you wanna add anything, that would be most welcome. And then this from Graham Hutchings, associate professor at University of Oxford China Center, do you think that Germany will have to come to a 
in quotation marks, new understanding in its relations with China, mm -hmm. um, much as it's been forced to do with respect to Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, two very good questions and uh, warm regards to Philip Lott, whom I know well. Um, I think it's sort of the easy part of the answer here is that sort of the civilian power um, attitude has identity is changing, but the more difficult part of the answer is what would it look like in the future? And the only way how I can imagine sort of Germany assuming a, well, not military identity, but at least an identity that as France and the UK do sort of embraces the military as part of its foreign policy tools, as part of its society, I think it will have to be framed in very, <clears throat> in very European terms. So I think any framing of German military in terms of Germany regaining strength and Germany regaining military positions is would not go down well and sort of the 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 very European identity the Germans have 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 had over the past. So it really has to be the framing of an identity that is stronger on military issues because of the European Union, because of allies, and because it is Germany's, and here I say the word again, responsibility <laughs> to, um, uh, to uh, contribute its fair share to Europe's defense efforts, which are now really not uh, anymore about deterring Russia, but really defending against Russia. Um, and I think this sort of European military identity is something that, 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 that I can imagine um, developing. And on relations with China, um, that's a very that's a very tricky and tough one because the way that uh, the path that Germany has traveled on Russia was so difficult and so painful that it really took a war now in Ukraine to get rid of the last assumptions of sort of uh, the past policy and the past um, stance on Russia. And I don't think Germany is anywhere close when it comes to China on this. Um, so. There has been a shift, shift on China's perception in Europe and in Germany in the last two years. There's an increasingly critical and negative view in the German public on China. But China, just also because of the geographical um, distance, is not perceived in any way as a threat. And I can't say whether um, a Chinese attack on Taiwan would create the same threat perceptions for Germans as uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine has created. And I honestly doubt it. So I think. With, well, China is certainly certainly understood to be an authoritarian country together with Russia. Um, uh, even in the crisis right now, we see that there are hopes that China can mediate um, the conflict. Um, those are prominent ideas in the German public, um, which I think are, are far-fetched, but they are prominent. And we have basically adopted the same um, change through trade approach towards China as we did towards Russia in the past only that with Russia, this approach is now dead and has been dead for quite a while. But when it comes to China, it's still pretty much alive. Um, so uh, assuming that Germany, because of the experience with Russia, Germany will translate that experience one-to-one -one on China, I think um, will, will not happen. I think understanding China and uh, building up sort of deterrence and resilience towards China will be a much more difficult task, um, perhaps also because Beijing will be smarter than, than Moscow was and not do something incredibly, <laughs> um, yeah, incredibly stupid and terrible as Russia has done now. Yeah, it's of course early days in this, in this war and, and one wants to be careful with projections, but it looks like contrary to some predictions before the war that China is one of the strategic losers because of the reawakening. Uh, of the West. And uh, I think if I can read between the lines, China sense that this is just too much disruption uh, and a possible chill in the in the Russia-China relationship. But that's, you know, that's that's mere speculation. Let me turn now to a to a to another question uh, from this from John Lawrence uh, of Dickinson and Wright. Could you please give us your thoughts regarding the durability of the shift in attitude in Russia? in the Social Democratic Party of Chancellor Scholz and his ability to maintain control of his own party on that shift and the consequent imp implementation uh, of it? So it's a great question about the SPD mm -hmm. and sort of where it goes. Um, also, there's a lot in your book about SPD and its, its attitudes toward, uh, toward Russia. And that's a, you know, it's a really uh, a pertinent and helpful question in terms of, uh, of this topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
uh, and I think this was for everyone who's watching German domestic politics, this was the most interesting thing to observe in the last weeks and months since the beginning of the year, how sort of the new three party coalition would, would play out and how the social democratic party would position itself. And we've seen, especially in January, very clear signs that Olaf Scholz at the beginning had um, difficulties to get his party under control. He's not the party leader. He has lost the party leader elections two years ago, which was a devastating blow to him. Um, he has lost the election to two left-wing leaders, which was also a blow to sort of his more pragmatic fas uh, faction within the party. And that's why we've seen all these statements coming out from left-wing party members um, uh, defending Nord Stream 2, which led to this whole confusion and anger here in Washington, but also in Eastern European countries. This has then changed very quickly. So the party leadership has started to um, uh, get those people who went out with these statements under control and they have shifted their position now to almost 180 degrees. So the party is very much aligned now on its position um, on Russia. There are a few outsiders, um, but those are not um, relevant particularly relevant voices in the party. And even um, the head of the Land mecklenburg vorpommern Manuela Schwesig, who is a very prominent and very powerful SPD politician and who sort of was always lobbying for Nord Stream 2, which would sort of um, uh, give economic opportunities to, to, to her land um, has now sort of fallen in line um, with, with the new policy. Um, and, from discussions with social democratic party members also sort of on the basis sort of the party uh, level, um, uh, it is, there was a fundamental rethink going on, a fundamental rethink about the way Willy Brandt was interpreted in the past, um, a fundamental rethink on how sort of Ostpolitik was interpreted and how especially um, uh, peace policy, peace and security policy can be redefined because in the past, one of the proudest traditions of the Social Democratic Party was sort of its legacy of Germany's reunification, peaceful, peaceful protest um, and uh, reconciliation with the Soviet Union. Um, and this is this continues uh, to be a process in the Social Democratic Party, but there's no um, there's no return to uh, past position. So we are definitely uh, past the point of no return and uh, the Social Democratic Party will um, will look very different uh, in the next months and years than it looked at the beginning of this year. I mean, I find it interesting that prior to the to the war, there was this prediction that Germany, because it's a new government, would be divided or sort of incapable of dealing with it. You had the experience of Chancellor Merkel and the relative inexperience of Chancellor but in a different sense, it's almost providential for Germany that the war began with a green foreign minister and an SPD chancellor, because if they create the policy, uh, it just suggests such a wide degree of unity. You have to assume that the CDU is CDU CSU is going to uh, be in very fundamental agreement with these two parties about how to move forward. But it really suggests a kind of uh, a degree of unity. We could have a comparable conversation about degrees of unity in American foreign policy, I think it's probably not quite as broad based as it is uh, in party political terms uh, in German foreign policy, but that's a conversation for uh, another day. I have now a, a question from Andrew uh, Dimond or Diamond. Uh, to what extent, if any, might Germany use stronger military capability for diplomatic and political ends other than simple deterrence or defense? And how might those uses of military power diverge from France's seemingly more ambitious global foreign policy goals? For Europe. So this takes us to the territory of strategic autonomy and, and, uh, and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just to add one point to what, what you said before, Michael, uh, I think in the US you say that only Nixon could have gone to China, right? And I think that's exactly. very much what is exactly. happening right now in, in German politics. I think if the conservatives would have proposed to jump the defense expenditure to over 2%, it would have not it would have not been possible, it would not get the support. The fact that the Social Democrats and the Greens together with the Liberals did that really showed everyone, okay, if even those parties who were traditionally more skeptical towards defense spending take the step, um, this must be very, a very, a very, yeah, a very serious issue. Um, about sort of what will Germany use this military for? I mean, I think we are sort of very much at the beginning of how this plays out 
but I do think that the goal of uh, sort of building up Germany's military will be territorial defense and um, defense of NATO allies very much. Um, I mean, Germany has been engaged in the past more or less successfully with missions abroad and sort of um, peace missions. Um, but the restructuring of the German army will be directed sort of towards uh, fighting a potential Russian threat. I think that's, that, that, that's going to be the main task rather than sort of using the military for a more global um, outreach. And I think this would also not get the kind of support that um, the German public is given now to these efforts because it is perceived as, well, we have to do this because we have to be able to defend ourselves and our partners and allies. So I would not expect German missions um, around the globe um, in the next five, five to 10 years, which, yeah, as, as, as the question said, was something that France was doing, um, was, was much more active. Um, and when it comes to sort of the strategic autonomy discussion, I think one of the crucial divides and discussions that we will have sort of in the transatlantic alliance now that there will be so many uh, capabilities and resources available to you, military will be, where will those be invested? So will this be invested into a European pillar of NATO or will we sort of, um, will Germany and France to push for EU security and defense um, capabilities? Um, this was what Macron always wanted, um, especially with a view to how reliable is the United States. But if you want a short and medium term strong response, then it would be obviously easier to rely on the institution that has already been there. I mean, NATO works and NATO knows how to do this and how to spend money, how to position itself. Whereas sort of building up EU security and defense right now would be very much an experiment. And I wonder, um, quoting Konrad Adenauer, whether this is really the, the time for experiments or the, whether this is a time for no experiments. Um, uh, so my guess would be that these capabilities first go into a European pillar with a NATO, um, but that Macron will definitely push for further steps on EU security and defense. And this will be a discussion um, which, which was there in the, in the last year too, when the US finally said, well, we are absolutely fine with the EU doing whatever they want, just sort of build up your capabilities and do something. So it's not, there's not such a strong tension anymore between EU and NATO as, as there sometimes has been in the past, but um, this will be a difficult decision uh, to make how to spend all this money um, and where to, uh, what to use it for in the EU and NATO context. Wonderful. You, you quote from uh, Konrad Adenauer. I'm always reminded of the quote from how much meat that those politicians who have vision should go to the <laughs> should go to the eye doctor. Uh, but in this case, it does seem like vision is uh, uh, is is called for, and this is actually a rather bold vision that's being put forward by uh, the, by the German government. So, with that in mind, we have a couple of further questions. Let me start in with one uh, about Merkel. I do think you've addressed pieces of this question coming from the staff at the Kennedy Institute, but it would be wonderful to hear more, how is the new German administration continuing on past Russia policy and how are they diverging from the, uh, from the Merkel uh, chancellorship? Uh, and I wonder if I could just tack on a small question of my own here. There's been some speculation that Angela Merkel, if, if mm -hmm. Putin wants to walk himself off the cliff, could be one of the interlocutors uh, and could perhaps help with a diplomatic settlement. I don't think anybody's holding their breath for that uh, to happen, but that has been discussed. Is there perhaps a role that Angela Merkel might play even mm -hmm. while she's she's out of office. So let's start there. And then there are two more very interesting questions to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just that you mentioned Helmut Schmidt, actually we would need a lot of Helmut Schmidt right now in Germany because he was not only a great chancellor, but he was, from my perspective, but he was also a great security and defense thinker. Um, uh, Professor Christina Spohr's biography of Helmut Schmidt is uh, something I can warmly recommend to understand that he was a strategic thinker and this is something which the Social Democratic Party unfortunately lacks at the moment. So we need more Helmut Schmidt's there. Um, on sort of where, where Russia is, um, where there's still continuities uh, to Germany's past Russia policy. I honestly think there are not a lot of continuities left anymore. Um, I think the only continuity one could argue for is that sort of the energy and, and oil relationship with Russia. But my impression is that this is upheld simply for the fact 
that um, the gas is needed in Europe. It is not upheld as in the past, as sort of a myth about um, German-Russian with stable relations, which in the Cold War, even Russia has delivered gas and so on. So it's really about the, the simple self-interest of Germany um, not to, uh, yeah, not to run out of gas. It's not that Germany wants to contribute um, or wants to keep this uh, energy relationship up with Russia for any political uh, for any political purpose. So I think at the moment it is the case that uh, almost all bridges um, have been burned, uh, also uh, between uh, Germany and Russia. Um, the question sort of who could uh, who could uh, help at the situation mediating or speaking to the Russian president, I would be very surprised if Angela Merkel would agree to do this because it doesn't seem to, to fit her sort of character. I mean, she takes decisions and then she sort of um, pulls it through. So she decided she's out of politics and that's it. I mean, here's, she's writing a biography, I think, or sort of a book, but she's not engaging in any other political context, not with the UN, not with anything else. And I think she would also be concerned, even if it is supported by the government, that this will obviously undermine um, Olaf Scholz's sta stance as a chancellor. Because I mean, one of the big questions that everyone was looking at was whether Olaf Scholz can fill the shoes of Angela Merkel and sending Angela Merkel to Moscow would certainly mean that he's not up to the job. It's true though that he is not engaging a lot in sort of crisis uh, diplomacy. Um, and now it's really the French president that calls the Russian president, tries to at least understand his thinking, even though he's not, he seems not to be able to change anything about it. Um, I haven't heard of any phone call uh, planned with, with, with Scholz and, and the Russian president. Another person that could play a role and that has been mentioned in the past is the Finnish president, um, Minister. I mean, he knows the Russian president well um, and yeah, and has been active in these situations in the past. I think the only problem here is that Finland itself feels threatened um, and that might have changed his, uh, his weight and his role as a not neutral but as someone who, who could talk to Moscow, I think today was the news that Finland and Sweden will take part in, in NATO's consultations from now on in every NATO consultation in the future, which will be certainly seen by Russia as, yeah, as Finland and Sweden moving closer to NATO. Um, this might perhaps undermine his position, but he certainly would be someone who, um, who, who could do this. Or Henry Kissinger. If it's one of the, <laughs> it's always a, um, a Henry Kissinger quote, something Henry Kissinger, one can learn from him, so. Apparently he's no longer physically able to get on, oh. mm -hmm. uh, get on airplanes, so it wouldn't be shuttle diplomacy, but uh, perhaps in our day and age, it could be done uh, over Zoom or something like that, or perhaps Israel could play a role uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, if, if, if it's at all possible, some, some diplomatic settlement to this. Uh, to this awful war. Um, with this awful war, you know, very much in mind, uh, and I myself saw photographs uh, this morning of, of uh, Ukrainians arriving at the New Berlin airport uh, and in various train stations and being met once again with uh, what had been called during the Syrian civil war, the Willkommenskultur uh, of Germany. And so there's a question about what you think Germany's response will be to the anticipated refugee flows, we could add to that the, the existing refugee flows existed and, and anticipated refugee flows caused by this war, and how might you compare it with Germany's response to the similar crisis or related crisis in, in Syria? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very good question. Um, what we see right now is sort of this welcoming culture, as you said, that we also had back then um, when, when Syrian refugees arrived in Germany. But back then, at some point, the mood shifted and there was a more yeah, critical or questioning attitude towards are we actually able to, uh, to manage this? As Merkel said, wir schaffen das. Um, everyone was saying, we will manage this. Everyone was saying, will we? Question mark. Um, and I think to some extent, the German public has also not been sufficiently prepared for the fact that this um, uh, uh, so many migrants and refugees can come from Ukraine because, as I said, for Berlin throughout January and throughout um, the beginning of February, there was the probability that a real war would break out 
um, was taken less seriously than the possibility that this was just a negotiation strategy by Russia. Um, and the other point is also that um, Ukraine is just, I mean, it's a huge country, it's 44 million. Um, uh, so this will be even in terms of sort of the numbers, uh, a greater, uh, an even greater challenge than 2015. What we see already now that there are sort of political steps by the European Union taken to make this easier. Um, and to manage this in a better way than 2015. So Ukrainian refugees can work within the EU, they get social insurances, um, something uh, which was not the, the case with Syrian refugees in 2015. And I think that's a very, very valid question to ask you why that was not the case in 2015. But at least now there is a strong effort to create the right political conditions to make this uh, successful. I think the open question here is um, for how long that planning goes. So, I mean, now it's certainly sort of a time frame of um, hosting refugees for, let's say, six months. But uh, if everything goes badly, there might be a point where these refugees cannot return at all or might only be able to return in, I don't know, five years. So, the point really is we are now planning for the short term management of sort of the refugees arriving in Europe, but what about the long term? Um, and uh, I pessimistically think that we have to think about the long term already now. Um, and that there was now no, I mean, there are not a few pathways one can imagine where uh, Ukrainian refugees could just easily return and continue their lives. Yeah, no, I'm afraid that that's all too uh, persuasive, that sort of um, you know, very sober, uh, concluding note that you uh, that you describe. Here's a different kind of question, um, but uh, you know, very important for German foreign policy. And this is the future of German energy policy within this within mm -hmm. this crisis. Of course, we don't quite know whether Russia will retaliate in some way by depriving Germany of uh, of gas or, or precipitously raising the uh, the price. But we can see already. I read this morning about speculation that oil will be at one point at $185 a barrel this year. Uh, and all of that, of course, matters a lot for uh, for industrial policy in Germany and, and for foreign policy as well. So, where do you see energy, and how do you think that 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 could play out within this crisis? Yeah, I, I think this is really the greatest homework that Germany has missed in the last years. Sort of the whole topic of energy diversification, exactly because of what I said before that there was a belief, oh, even in Cold War times, energy with Russia was fine, so we don't really have to move. We are more dependent than other European states, but that's not a problem because we have great relations with Russia. I mean, this been, has been such a bad awakening. Um, and I remember, I think about a week before the outbreak of the war, I was still in a discussion with. Um, a representative from an energy company who was convinced that um, Nord Stream 2 would, would go on as, uh, as it is the case. So what we see at the moment is a little bit of a frantic uh, planning and energy management um, taking place in Berlin. Um, and this is very much the task of uh, Robert Habeck, the vice chancellor and one of the former uh, Green Party leaders, because he has now to rethink the whole energy uh, security and energy supply um, issue for Germany. And what is remarkable is that as a Green Party leader, he already said in a, in a television statement that all options are on the table, which means that the option of sort of reversing Germany's new exit from nuclear um, energy uh, could also be discussed by the, would also be taken into the into consideration um, by the Greens, which is something, um, I mean, this is how the party was born, <laughs> that they were protesting against nuclear, nuclear, nuclear energy. Um, and I think this shows how fundamental this shift is for Germany. Um, there will be certainly a wish to um, make this a green transition and to make this a renewable transition. But um, I'm not uh, enough of a gen energy expert to say whether this is actually realistic or whether um, we will rely a lot on LNG um, uh, from the United States, uh, Norwegian gas, because it's just yeah very difficult to change the whole energy mix of, of a country within a few couple of weeks. Okay, uh, we have um, one uh, other question from our audience and I will uh, tack on one question to that. If you don't mind, we'll sort of bundle these two questions together. 
uh, and then you have a, you know, a very good 10 minutes or so to answer them and to offer us any closing observations or thoughts uh, that you might have. So the first question comes from John Lawrence, and this is regarding China. Uh, it's currently pursuing a secondary boycott against goods that incorporate Lithuanian parts and software, including those of German manufacturers. This is occurring because of Lithuania's allowing a representative office of Taiwan to open. Do you have a sense whether either Germany or the EU might now take a more robust position on this economic action by China? So question number one. Question number two is, is, is one that I wanna ask you uh, and you know be a little bit sharp for a moment, but it feels to me that in DC at the moment, there are some maximalist arguments that are, uh, that are surfacing. The no-fly zone would be uh, an example, and not that I think anybody is saying this explicitly, but I think there is an expectation in certain corners that the sanctions regime is really uh, is really about regime change uh, in Russia, that things have gone so far, things are so bad, Putin is so dangerous, we need to really undermine support for him so that somebody better comes uh, in his place. Now, maybe I'm exaggerating, I don't think this is the position of the Biden administration, so to that degree it's not uh, of the essence for the German government. But if I'm right that there is the potential for the US to move uh, <clears throat> toward a very tough Russia policy, I'm wondering if, you know, Schultz's government would go the distance. I'm wondering if they might again see themselves as a bit of a balancing factor uh, and as a bit of a counterweight. Obviously, there's going to be no going back, exactly as you said, there's no going back to the earlier policies. And uh, the shift is the most important story. But I don't think that this is going to terminate debates that are held between various European governments in the US or between Germany and the US uh, on Russia policy. I think there still will be debates and I'm curious if you anticipate any differences of opinion or ways in which uh, Germany might in the future distinguish itself uh, from, uh, from, from US Russia policy. So the first about China and Lithuanian parts and the second about whether certain debates may be ongoing and if, if there's the potential for a bit of daylight or distance between Washington and Berlin. Yeah, I think very good and excellent questions. On the Lithuania and China question, I think it was France that already mentioned in discussions with the Chinese side, the Lithuania issues, which is which is a good step. And I could imagine that, I mean, this moment of solidarity where, the, where Europe finds itself in right now, that this will also sort of um, extend to or the sort of feeling that we will not be bullied um, and we will not be divided by authoritarian countries like Russia and China, that this leads also to a greater feeling of solidarity when it comes to, to, to Lithuania and, um, it's, uh, and the conflict with China. Um, but I mean, this will certainly be sort of rather the case of German politicians um, addressing this issue towards China, something which I can very well, well imagine that Annalena Baerbock would do. Um, I think there was a case to make that there was a feeling of now Europe has to move closer together to defend itself and to be a sort of in solidarity and that this can sort of spill over to China policy. Um, that's, that's certainly something which, which I can very, very well imagine in the future. Um, about no fly zone and the regime change discussion. I mean, Germany's civilian power has been thrown out of the window, um, but I don't think that Germany's pragmatism has been thrown out of the window. I think that, that would be my response. There was still a very clear line that is drawn in Germany um, uh, sort of between war in Ukraine and the support for weapon deliveries to Ukraine and a war with Russia. And I think sort of the nuclear dimension of this all is very present in Germany. Um, there's a very strong yeah, uh, uh, remembrance of the Cold War times where Germany was a front state um, back then. Um, so I think the appetite for any kind of um, involvement which yeah, which would lead to an escalation between NATO and Russia is, is very, very low. And I think uh, this, if, if only for that, this is the reason why this would not happen because there needs to be consensus within NATO and obviously a no-fly zone as clean as it sounds, something which would require um, intense military engagement, not only in the air, but also on the ground um, against anti-air missiles and so on. So this is something which I can just not imagine taking, taking off in Germany as a discussion. Um, regime change 
I think this is certainly not something which Germany would ever say explicitly, because German policy and Germany's policy aims are sort of always framed in very pragmatic terms. But implicitly, I think no one would be sad if, <laughs> if there was a change in leadership in Russia. Um, let me put it this way. And I think the question really is, that sort of, I mean, this would certainly not be sort of the obvious uh, goal or stated goal of the policy because it would be just, I mean, would be just stupid. It would, would, would make it more difficult for Russians inside Russia to protest because they would be seen as a colored revolution. Um, it would, uh, uh, yeah, it would just in any way um, be counterproductive to do so. But the question here really is sort of implicitly, if we think about our policies, what other options do we have available um, uh, to to deal with Russia. I mean, obviously, if the Russian president um, remains in power, um, what else can be done if we see already now that all the contacts that we have, that, that nothing helps? I mean, that the president is sort of very much in a small circle. There's no access to him. Little factions or other groups in Russia that can influence his thinking even sort of the direct line with Macron is um, is not, I mean, it's working, but it doesn't get us to any results. So I think this is really the question. No, there will be no explicit regime change policy, but the question is what, what else are we going to do? I mean, then the answer will probably be uh, containment, um, containing Russia everywhere where it is possible, um, uh, sort of, Probably not containment in the in the global sense as it was the case in the in the Cold War, but more containment um, within Europe. I think this this will probably be the the strategy of of the next years. And I think, and this is perhaps just a concluding uh, remark. Uh, um, I think it is really now is really the time where some of the skepticism towards sort of a prominent German role in this, in this, in, in Europe and in the world um, will diminish even, even further than it has so in the past. I mean, we've seen this with the financial and economic crisis. We've been, seen it with the Ukraine um, uh, conflict and war in 2014. Um, now it's really, uh, it's not anymore a German question, but now we are really dealing with the Russia question in Europe. Um, and I don't think that the German question, although I remember all these articles about what if, uh, about Cayman, for instance, what if uh, the US withdraws its security guarantees, will Europe go back to the uh, to 19th century thinking and start fighting each other again? The German question will be back again about German dominance in Europe. I think Russia has done a lot to prevent this um, and, uh, and to make sure that um, there will be no Germany question, but a Russia question for the next decades, perhaps ahead. Well, that's a very eloquent way uh, to draw our conversation to a close. Let me just show our audience once again the cover of the book and offer to our audience my highest recommendation for this book. Um, I think we all, in a sense, need to escape the extreme presentism uh, of the moment. Uh, and this book is one of the things that allows us to uh, to do so, and also to understand the scope of the extraordinary changes in German foreign policy of the last couple of weeks, I think we really need to retain a very detailed and clear understanding of what had come before, and that's exactly what your book uh, provides. So um, I'm just delighted that uh, uh, my friend uh, Liana could join uh, uh, the long view today and share all of her erudition and insight uh, and uh, and wisdom with us. Um, and you know. We hope to have you back on the long view uh, when your next book comes out, or, or perhaps even a bit, uh, even a bit sooner. But uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And let me just offer a few, um, you know, sort of simple concluding remarks about uh, about this this uh, this show and sort of where it fits in the uh, in the Kennan Institute. You can visit our website, the Kennan Institute website, if you'd like to stay up to date with com upcoming events, of which there are many related to Ukraine, of course, but also to surrounding issues. There are also uh, the Canon X podcast and the Russia File podcast, which are very active these days in, in, in delving into the issues that are unfolding before our eyes. Uh, and uh, also um, latest analysis of Russia and the region on the Russia File and on Focus Ukraine. Um, 
you know, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at future installments of the Long View and want to thank once again Global Europe at the Kennedy, uh, not at the Kennedy Institute, Global Europe at the Wilson Center uh, for co-sponsoring this event. And most of all, thanks to Dr. Liana Fix for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Michael, for the invitation. And also thank you to all the viewers for the, for the excellent questions. It was, a, uh, it was a great discussion. Have a very good day. Thanks again. Vielen Dank. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen.